I am not a student of AFI, unfortunately, but I learn a lot, especially I learn not to accept anything as given, but every theory has to be verified by experiments. And I'm going to tell you very shortly about experiments. It took us four years to perform. It's not a simple experiment. And I, it was done mainly by my student here that you see. He is a very capable and very uh, talented student who not only built the system, which is complicated, but also analyzed the data and the results. And the problem was brought to my attention by my colleague and ex-student, Professor Ori Cheshnovsky, also from Tel Aviv University, who pointed out a very simple fact to my attention. We all study quantum <coughs> physics, and some of us even teach it. And it's a beautiful mathematical construct. Self-contained, there are known axioms and there are known results. And there is only one assumption there, well, not an assumption, a theorem that connects what we calculate from quantum physics, namely the wave function, with some observable phenomena. So the quantum mechanics tells us that every particle can be represented by a wave function and that the probability of finding a particle, in, a particle in a certain position and time is the square of this wave function. This is the only connection between quantum theory and reality, what we measure. And to my enormous surprise when Ori told me about it was this has not been verified experimentally. We just take it as given. And that kind of made me angry. How can it be that we use this theorem for more than 100 years and we never tested the accuracy of such an assumption? Is there a simple way to test it? And there is a simple way to test it. Well, it's not simple, but it can be done. So what I propose is that we, suppose we have a source for the wave function that emanates from two slit. It's called it or a single slit. Uh, experiment. If we have a wave function which is composed of wave function coming from two sources, then the probability should be the square of that, which means that it should contain the amplitude from single slits and the term which we call the interference term, we call it IAB, which combines the phase of the two wave functions to create a new wave function. Another corollary, I will show you an example in a minute. Another corollary is that if we have a wave function which represents a three-slit experiment, then the results still being the square of this wave function contains only single-slit function and two-slit function. In other words, in quantum mechanics, there should be no three-term slit expressions, only single and two-slit terms. What you see in the upper two slides is a simulation of a wave propagating from the right, a plane wave going through a slit and emerging as a spherical wave. And this represents what happens when you have two slits. You see the interference patterns. And if we cut and plot the intensity on the screen here, this is a single slit diffraction pattern, and this is a two slit diffraction pattern. And we can continue. It turns out that this simple expression can be arrived at with that these simple expressions can be calculated very accurately if we use a variety of physical methods. We can use Huygens principle. We can use uh, Feynman path integrals. We can use uh, other uh, way of calculating. We end up with a simple result, something that looks like that. So that immediately brings us to a possible experimental situation. <clears throat> Let us make an experiment which contains a single slit, double slit, and triple slits, 
and see if indeed the results of a triple slit experiment is composed of the components of two slits and single slits, as this expression says. And if there is any deviation, we call it a Sorkin parameter, and we can measure the Sorkin parameter and see if indeed this Born hypothesis of squaring the wave function is true or false. Now, to my surprise, as I said, people started getting interested in this problem only about 10 years ago. And the main reason was that there were not good sources of, say, particles and good detectors of particles that will allow us to test this hypothesis to high accuracy. This represents a diffraction experiment with a very good source, laser, and very good detectors, photomultipliers, to compute the Sorkin parameter as a function of the position on the screen. And indeed, it gives us a zero result on the average, but look at the errors. They amount to something like a few percent. And a quantum electrodynamic calculation can calculate the spectra of hydrogen to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 10, the best theory ever. So how come that the basic assumption has not been tested even to few percent? Perhaps the most elegant experiment, or why should we worry about it? We, worry, we should worry about it that if we calculate the interference pattern using uh, path integrals, Feynman path integrals, then Feynman path integrals says that we should calculate not only the waves coming from one of the slits to the screen or another slit, like these uh, dotted curves, but it should also contain all possible passes. Some possible passes are plotted here in blue. You see the photon can go through one slit and then turn around and combine with the photon on the screen, which is not physically easy to, to imagine, but it can be done. And if you calculate these path integrals, you will end up with something which is surprising. If you include in your calculation not only the classically allowed trajectories, but also those that are strange, like the ones in blue here, then you expect something which will not be a simple interferogram that you will get using wave equation. You should get something different. And indeed, this experiment was done only recently. Instead of using photons from lasers and the photodetectors, they used microwaves. And most people don't know it, but microwave sources are as good, or as coherent, or even better than most lasers. And what uh, Sinha did, he's from India, he put a source, microwave source, he put a diffraction three-slit pattern and a detector, and he could move the detector and measure the intensity or the Sorkin parameter as a function of distance, and he found out that the Sorkin parameter is not zero. In fact, it is almost 10% away from zero, which means that the non-classical contribution to the interference is very severe in this case. Can kind of a surprise to me. It, is, it can be thought of as if the electromagnetic wave going through these baffles, these slits, can create surface uh, currents in the slit structure, and these uh, surface currents can propagate and again uh, being radiated again. And this is what happens. So Feynman path integral in this particular experiment allows you to include contribution from non-classical trajectories, and the end result is that the Sorkin parameter is far from zero. The situation in... This is, as you can see, quite recent. It appeared last year. Surprise. Nobody bothered to measure it before. And then I thought, okay, Maybe we can rationalize that because imaging surface currents and 
radiating photons across the surface is uh, not something unimaginable. And in fact, since I put baffles here to eliminate these surface currents, and he saw that if these baffles are large enough, namely you, subtra you inhibit the surface propagation photons, then the soaking parameter drops down to almost zero. And now the question arises, what happens with the material particle? Will it behave in the same way? Will we show something that is different from what you calculate Fraunhofer diffraction? And the experiments that were done are not many, two of them, in fact. One of them was measuring helium diffraction from nanoslits, which is what I will do in the future, or I did in, the future, in a short time. But uh, you can see that the uh, fluctuations are in the neighborhood of 10%. So you cannot expect to measure the uh, propagation with an accuracy which is better than 10%. A slightly different experiment, again a free slit experiment, you see this is a single slit diffraction of a large molecule. This experiment was done in Vienna. It was published recently, uh, last 12 months. And they measured the single slit, the two slits, and the three slits, and combined and subtracted them to get something that looks like that, almost zero, which is what we expect, the soaking parameter to be zero. But uh, again, the small number of molecules was not good enough to ascertain that this deviation from zero is accurate. So then we moved, we decided we can do a better experiment. We have a good source of metastable argon, uh, metastable helium atoms, which we developed and now is useful, is used in many labs. And we can collimate the, la the beam to generate, you see this is the, diff the pattern that you get if you don't have any slits. So we have a very narrow beam. Why do we have to be, why does it have to be very narrow? The reason is that the de Broglie wavelength, even of a very light atom like helium, is extremely small, 50 picometer. And if you make a slit, the smallest slit you can reliably make is on the order of 100 nanometer. So if you calculate the diffraction pattern, it's the dimension of the slit divided by the wavelength, you get a very small diffraction angle. <coughs> the wavelength is just too small. So we had to stretch the technology to the limit, produce a very collimated atomic beam, collimated better than this pointer of the laser. This is about one milliradian we had to beam a beam system with 10 times better collimation. And we had to machine the slits to 100 nanometer, which is state-of-the-art technology. You see, this is the system the way it was looking. A single slit, two slits, three slits, separated two slits. And we put this mask with the slits in front of a highly collimated supersonic beam machine. Now, making these slits, as I said, is a state of the art, pushing the state of the art of nano machining to the limit. Why? Because you see, we could machine slits with this. We, ima we image these with electron microscope, and you could measure the slits, and these are the statistical measurements. As you see, the accuracy with which we can machine a slit is about one nanometer. One nanometer is about five atomic layers. There is not much room for improvement in that. So we machined the slit with the best accuracy we could, which is about one nanometer out of 100 nanometer, roughly. And we measure, we measure the diffraction of a single slit, two slit, two slits which are separated, and this is three slit. And you see these are different diffraction patterns. And the idea is that if you take the free slit and subtract the two slits and then the like the soaking parameter, we should get zero. 
Well, not really. We don't get zero. You see, we get already to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 3 here, the difference from zero. But we still get fluctuation. And for a long time, I did not know how to solve this problem until I realized ah, our slits are not all the same, and they have about one nanometer difference between each of them, five layers of atoms. So let us put that into the simulation and see what we should get for the soaking parameter if we use the actually measured slit widths that were produced in a state-of-the-art machine that we have in our nanocenter. And once you do that, then you get the red curve. And you see, we could reproduce most of the non-zero contributions. So the next stage was, okay, let us subtract them, let us do the Fourier analysis and filter out those that we are accounting for. So after filtering out, this is the result we got. This is the soaking parameter. It should be zero. It's not zero. It's zero plus minus 10 to the minus 4. So in this particular situation, Bohm was right to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 4. And there is not much we can do more with present technology. Maybe a factor of five if we get to one atom distribution, uh, one atom error in the slit. But this is the best result so far. And it was published recently, as I showed on the last slide. And this is the end of the talk.